If you've ever been in an elevator, you can imagine a scenario where you're in that elevator and accelerating upwards with an acceleration A. This could either be because you're going up and you just started going up, or because you're going down and decelerating, which is the equivalent of accelerating up. In either scenario, you might feel heavier than usual, like your legs are pushing down on the ground with more force, more than your usual weight generated by G, the acceleration due to gravity alone. Let's write this as a classical mechanics problem. You've got a mass m, and you're in an elevator with weight mg directed down, and a normal force n directed up. If you and the elevator are accelerating upwards with an acceleration a, then the net force on you is just n minus mg, which should equal ma by Newton's second law. This means that the normal force n is just your mass m times the sum of a and g. Now let's suppose that you're standing on a weighing machine in the elevator. The weighing machine will then be exerting this normal force n on you, so by Newton's third law now, you'll be exerting an equal and opposite force on the weighing machine. This means that according to the weighing machine, your weight won't just be mg, it'll be m times g plus a. So with this elevator problem in mind, let's examine two separate scenarios. In the first scenario, I'm going to assume that my elevator is in freefall, meaning that the acceleration of the elevator A is just negative G. Remember that A is directed up by our default sign convention, so if the elevator is in freefall, A would then be a negative number, so negative G. When that happens, the weight of the person inside the elevator is just zero, that person is weightless. This means that someone who's in freefall inside a gravitational field will feel weightless, just like someone who's far away in deep space from any masses would. This feeling of weightlessness is shared between these two situations. The second scenario I'll examine is the case when my elevator is accelerating up, but outside a gravitational field. The elevator's in deep space, for instance. This means that g is zero, but the elevator is still accelerating at, say, 9.81 meters per second squared up. In that case, the weighing machine for my person is going to read 9.81 times the mass of that person. So this time, even though my elevator is far away from any sources of gravity, my person in the elevator still feels like they're on Earth because their weight is exactly what it would be on Earth. So what do we conclude from these two scenarios? Well, we can conclude from the first scenario that the situation of free fall is similar to the situation of being stationary or at a constant velocity in deep space. We can also conclude that accelerating upwards at a rate equal to the Earth's gravitational acceleration is similar to the situation of just standing on Earth. The core idea behind general relativity isn't just that these pairs of situations are similar to each other, it's that they are equivalent to each other. Let me explain what that means by introducing the equivalence principle. Just like special relativity, general relativity is based on some foundational postulates. The equivalence principle is that foundational postulate. There's two different versions of the equivalence principle, three if you count the Einstein equivalence principle being its own separate one, but the two ones that we're going to discuss are the weak principle and the strong principle. We'll start with the weak principle, which corresponds to the first conclusion we drew in our elevator problem, the conclusion that being in free fall is equivalent to being in deep space without the influence of any gravitational objects. But what do I mean by equivalent? Well, I mean that the laws of motion for an uncharged point particle are the same in a freely falling reference frame and in an inertial reference frame that's floating in deep space without any gravitational influence. By the way, an inertial reference frame just means a reference frame and coordinate system traveling at a constant velocity. This is straight from special relativity. So if I'm in a rocket ship that's freely falling towards the Earth's surface, and if I throw an uncharged ball across this rocket ship with a certain initial velocity v sub i, then the trajectory and path of this ball will be the exact same as that of another ball thrown with the same initial velocity, but this time in a rocket ship that's just floating out in deep space. This is the weak equivalence principle. It's sometimes also called the universality of free fall. And another way of phrasing it, which isn't my favorite way, is that gravitational mass is equal to inertial mass, meaning that the mass that acts as the source of gravity is equal to the mass that gets accelerated by a force. Now, the strong equivalence principle, on the other hand, is an extension of our second conclusion above. 
Here's the idea. Suppose I have two observers. One observer A is in a rocket accelerating upward in deep space with an acceleration of G, 9.80665 meters per second squared. Again, by deep space, I mean that the rocket isn't surrounded by anything else that would influence or create a gravitational field around it. Nothing with mass or energy or anything anywhere close by, just empty space. Meanwhile, the second observer B is hanging around on the surface of a planet with a uniform gravitational field of G. This observer is also in a rocket, but stationary on the ground, not accelerating anywhere per se. The strong equivalence principle says that the laws of physics, so not just the laws of motion, but the laws of physics observed by observer A are equivalent to those observed by observer B. Without looking outside, there is no way for either A or B to tell whether they're in a rocket accelerating up or whether they're resting on the ground in an area with a uniform gravitational field of G. Let me reiterate, without looking outside, neither observer can tell whether they're accelerating up at G or resting on the ground with gravity pulling down at G. In technical terms, you can translate without looking outside to via a local experiment. A local experiment is just an experiment that only interacts with the inside of the rocket over a small region of space-time. It doesn't interact with the outside world and allow you to look out and tell where you are. It is localized to the small region of space-time of the rocket and the rocket alone. So essentially, the strong equivalence principle argues that the laws of physics and the results of local experiments are the same in a reference frame with constant acceleration and a reference frame in a uniform gravitational field. There's no difference between the two. Now, the key phrase I've used here is uniform gravitational field. Over large space-time distances, something like Earth is not a fully uniform gravitational field. Gravity varies slightly from region to region on Earth, and the Earth is also spherical, which means the gravitational field points inwards towards the center instead of being uniform and pointing in the same direction throughout. But the strong equivalence principle still holds even for Earth as long as you assume that you're working in small enough regions of space-time that these non-uniformities, these tidal effects, disappear. So these are your equivalence principles, and if you want a single takeaway from this discussion, it's that an accelerating reference frame is equivalent and gives you the same observations as a reference frame in a uniform gravitational field, or even a non-uniform gravitational field over small enough regions of space-time. Acceleration is equivalent to gravity. Let's now apply the equivalence principle, particularly the strong equivalence principle, to describe what happens to a ray of light in a gravitational field. Now, because of the equivalence principle, if we want to know the path of a ray of light in a uniform gravitational field, we just need to examine the path of the ray of light in an equivalent accelerating reference frame, which I'll call gamma 1. Determining and analyzing gamma 1 is theoretically easier and more intuitive, as I'll show you. Then, by the equivalence principle, we can conclude that the path gamma 2 that the ray of light will follow in the uniform gravitational field will be the same as gamma 1. So let's then consider an accelerating frame far away in deep space. Suppose that I have a rocket that's really wide, about 600 million meters or so, which conveniently is the distance that light travels in two seconds. We'll put my observer inside this rocket like so, and we'll assume that the rocket starts from rest and uniformly accelerates upwards at 10 meters per second squared. Now at time zero, when the rocket just starts moving, suppose that I fire a ray of light from just outside the left end of the rocket ship. It should be easy to see that according to someone outside the rocket, so in an inertial reference frame outside the rocket, the ray of light will just travel completely straight and horizontally. It'll be somewhere in between the rocket at one second and it'll be closer to the right end at two seconds. This should hopefully make sense. But where does the rocket come in? Well, at one second, the rocket will have gone up by five meters from where it started, so it'll look something like this. To get the five meters, I just used half at squared. That's the equation for displacement in a uniformly accelerated straight line motion. At two seconds, the rocket will have gone up by 20 meters, again based on half at squared. So from the perspective of the observer inside the rocket, light starts out on the left end up over here, by one second, the ray of light has curved down by five meters, and by two seconds, when the ray of light is almost at the other end of the ship, it has curved down by 20 meters compared to when it started. So instead of traveling in a straight horizontal line like it did for the inertial observer who's viewing this from afar, the ray of light curves down according to somebody in the accelerated rocket. 
By the equivalence principle, this means that light will then follow the exact same path in a uniform gravitational field where the gravitational acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. So just like how light curved downwards according to the rocket observer, light will also curve downwards according to someone sitting in a uniform gravitational field with the same gravitational acceleration. This is a pretty powerful conclusion because we've shown just from the equivalence principle that light bends under the influence of gravity. Gravity curves light. Now, you might have already seen this bending when you did problems in projectile motion. If I throw some mass horizontally above the ground in a uniform gravitational field G, then that mass's trajectory will also bend towards the ground like so. The shape of the trajectory will be very similar to the shape that our light rays trajectory took under gravity. The difference is that the mass can't get to the speed of light unless you do an infinite amount of work on it. So the trajectory won't be the exact same, but it'll bend towards the ground just like the trajectory of light did. But this is also a little weird because light has no mass. This has consistently been shown in experiment after experiment. Light is massless. However, gravity traditionally is supposed to be a force that results when one mass attracts another mass, according to this equation, this Newton's law of universal gravitation. In Newtonian gravity, we shouldn't observe this bending of light because there cannot be a force on a massless entity like light. This means that the equivalence principle contradicts Newtonian gravity because we've got a massless entity like light that's quote unquote attracted to the massive object that is the source of the gravity. So what's actually correct then, the equivalence principle or Newtonian gravity? Well, both the weak and strong versions of the equivalence principle have been tested and verified multiple times in many, many experiments. The Eotvos experiment, satellite testing, lunar laser ranging experiments, the list goes on. So the best way to reconcile this contradiction with Newtonian gravity is to actually discard Newtonian gravity and propose a new formulation of gravity. Gravity is not an attraction between two masses. It's a completely different phenomenon. And in the next video, I'm going to describe this phenomenon. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.